six. <laughs> it is six thirty on Wednesday, April seventh, and I am calling the meeting of the West Bridgewater Board of Selectmen to order. Please stand for the pledge of allegiance. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, this meeting will remain closed to the public. There are no scheduled public hearings and there will be no public comment period. Live audio and video of the meeting will be aired on Comcast Local Channel 9. Additionally, a recording of the meeting will be posted on the West Bridgewater Community Access Video On Demand website at https colon slash slash wb hyphen dot org slash vod slash. Okay, at 630, we have an application for garage repair license for Spitshine Motorcycle Shop located at 104 Turnpike Street, 5R. Uh, is this a public hearing? No. Um, so I believe that the vendor is on uh, speakerphone. Uh, what he is looking to do, his, his, um, his business, unfortunately, was the business that had a fire up on, um, on uh, south of town, on South Main Street. Yep. And so he's looking to move it over to 104 Turnpike Street. My understanding is everything is in order. Um, but again, he's on the phone if you have any direct questions for, for uh, Mr. Greenberg. Are you, uh, can you hear us okay, Scott? Yeah. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'm excited that I want to go back to work. I bet. We want you to go back to work, too. Is this a temporary move, or is this permanent? I'm going to do this permanently. Oh, okay. I think Bobby Maine and his mom, Doris, are going to be Well, we're happy to hear that for you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I do not. No, okay. no, no questions. I'm sorry for all of this. I can't imagine going through this ordeal, but I'm glad you're able to set up and have a new location. We're very happy for you. No, oh, thank you. So is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the um, change or the relocation of license. I'll second. OK, all those in favor? Can I hand yes? Anderson, yes. Raise yes. Thank you for joining us, and we wish you the very best. No, thank you so much. So we're a go? Yes, you're a go. We love you too. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. He is very excited. Yes. I am happy for him. That's good to hear. Okay, 635. We have an application for transfer of a common victual license for Om um, El Noor Inc. DBA Star Pizza. Located at 43 North Main Street, formerly St. Angelo's Inc. DBA Star Pizza. So this here is Star's Pizza, which is right next door down here on the on the uh, little strip mall. Um, we are changing from the previous owner to a new owner. There is no uh, there is no alcohol involved. All this is is common back. He does like subs and that type of stuff. Um, we had a technological issue with the owner earlier, so he can't join us. It was just it was too difficult. But it looks like everything is in order. It looks like Lorna's happy. Everybody else is happy. And where there is no alcohol involved, it, it looks like it's a pretty simple, clean transfer. 
So we would be looking to ask the board to approve the transfer from one owner to the next. Okay, are there any questions? I do not have any. No, no, no question. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve this, um, approve this application. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Can you hand yes? Anderson, yes. Grace, yes. All right, moving on to the vote on the fiscal year budget. So um, this is you know, what we all work on for the last couple of months. And so our town meeting is scheduled for May 17th. So the process is, is that I will present to you, I've reviewed all the budgets, I will present to you my recommendations. The Board of They will then vote on their recommendations of the budget. They vote on is the budget that gets read at town meeting. So you know when they yell off moderator, 588, board of selectmen, that budget is what they will do. But the column will show what you approved and then what they recommend. Um, so um, I have before you an executive summary. Uh, I have reviewed all the budgets and gone through them all line by line. First, uh, I do want to say that increase for the entire year uh, is less than $700,000. So when you think about 252 employees, a full service town on a $36 million budget, that the increases were so minimal. And as a result of that, I do want to say thank you to all the unions uh, on the town side and also to all of the non-union departments <coughs> and all non-union employees as well. 75 to 80 percent of our cost outside of benefits is all uh, salary related. So the fact that everybody, including people who are under contract, um, they voluntarily chose to take the zero percent. I just want to say thank you to all of them, and um, you know, and thank you to the board for your flexibility on that. But I think that's been a bit saving, saving for the taxpayer and for the town. Mm -hmm. So with that said, um, you'll see that. The proposed budget that I'm going to propose to you is has an operational <coughs> increase of 1.92%. That includes the water department. There are only really two major drivers this year. Um, based on the budget I'm going to recommend to you, that's a $444,000 increase in the local school and a $209,000 in benefits. Most of that increase is it's either health insurance or um, it's our retirement assessment. Um, the water department's budget is actually down year over year. Um, but if you exclude the school, then the town's operating budget is up 737000 or 2.16%. I will inform you that, again, as I mentioned earlier, there are 0% COLA raises throughout the entire town. <clears throat> but where appropriate, whenever there was contractual step raises, that those have been funded. Um, uh, in reference to the school department, uh, the school department... Um, uh, we've, it reflects a reduction in the school department request, which is equivalent to what it would be if the teachers had a 0% raise. I will get over to get to that in just a moment. Um, that is $222,000. So I reduced the school budget by $222,000 to reflect that. Um, I will say that in the, the budget um, under the town, the Board of Selectmen control, that there are no new hires nor is there any budgets for increase in staff hours. And just because we do know that we remember we're budgeting. Mm -hmm. This is, is April. This budget has to be good until July of next year. So we're 15, 16, 17 months away. We have to have a finance committee reserve in case there is any unforeseen expenditures. We have fully funded that $67,000 the same year over year. So we have some money there if we need it. Um, under, um, there's been a lot of discussion. Oh, no worries, thank you. Um, there's been a lot of discussion I've seen between people on social media about, you know, how it doesn't look like the town is hurting. It doesn't look like there's a reduction in revenues. There is. Um, I've put together on the summation page here exactly how it's going to work. But right now, uh, if you look at what our town operating budget increase is, it's six hundred ninety-nine thousand three hundred fifteen dollars. Um, our re our receipts um, from FY twenty because we're in FY twenty-one right now, so we don't know 
how they're all going to come. We don't have an exact dollar amount. But I sat with the treasurer and I sat with the town accountant. We went through everything line by line. We spent a couple of hours and, and really dug in. And it looks like our receipts this year are going to come in about $2.5 million. Just to let you know, that's if that's true, that's $644,000 less than it was in FY20. That is majorly, that the major drivers in that is that we're, we're seeing a reduction in meals tax of a couple hundred thousand dollars. But we're also seeing a major reduction in excise tax. Remember, when you buy a car, the first year you always have the highest bill and then it depreciates over time, so it comes down over time. Nobody bought cars this past year. Right? I mean, I think most people know that. So um, there were cars being bought over the previous couple of years. Um, so that's going to come down. The other is, is that a major driver of revenue for us on the excise tax is enterprise. And nobody's renting cars. So they're not buying cars. They're not storing cars. And they have a large facility up on West Street. So we are seeing a drastic reduction from there. Um, our building permit fees are actually pretty much flat year over year. Uh, that's a good positive. Um, and then a lot of our other smaller incremental revenue is down year over year as well. Um, in, for example, when we collect $22 million a year in property tax, <clears throat> that money sits in the bank. Historically, we actually make a couple of hundred thousand dollars in interest on that, and that goes to help the bottom line. But we're not getting any money on that interest. <laughs> There's literally no interest on that. Even at $22 million, we're still only, we're, we're, I think year to date, we were somewhere around 80 grand. Um, that's a minuscule payout for having that type of cash sitting in the bank. So our actual receipts are down. The positive is, is that our state aid receipts net total is about $436,000 to the better. If we raise it two and a half percent based on our levy from last year, that represents just under $591,000. So if you just do those simple math equations, which is the major drivers of what we, we um, allocate, that means that we're right now upside down $316,000. So if we approve the budget that I'm recommending and all the revenues come in that realistically look like this is what the numbers would be, we would still be in the hole by about $316,000. Now, I'm not overly concerned about that because we do know that under the most recent stimulus package, we're going to receive as a town over two years we estimate that we're going to receive in about 718000 which is $359,000 per year. So if that money comes in and I can allocate it for almost all the reasons that we need to, that will plug that gap. So we don't have to worry about raising more taxes. We don't have to worry about trying to provide more revenue or cutting anything. We think in this case here, we'd actually break even and be okay. So that's my overview. Um, if you have questions on that, that's good. If not, I will actually go over the specific changes that I made inside the budget. On your end, it sounds like you're on, but on our end, we can't see you, but they can hear you fine. Okay. So just, just a couple questions, David. The um, So the excise tax, that's money that won't be replaced. The restaurant tax, that's, that won't be replaced. That That's revenue gone. Um, I mean, they could buy a vehicle in another year. That's revenue for that year. But for this fiscal year, or this fiscal year, revenue is gone. Well, how are real estate taxes coming in? Are they coming in slower than usual, or are they yeah, so, consistent um, with past years? So what I did under my revenue, I actually said that um, personal and property tax collections continue at just a tick below historical norms. I put a tick because that's what the um, kind of town treasurer used. <laughs> um, okay. But um, it's, they're almost on pace. I mean, look, um, we know that businesses are struggling and we know people are struggling or some people aren't, some businesses aren't. Um, but you have to pay your taxes, you know? And so, um, and because most people who have residential homes have a mortgage, it's paid through the mortgage. So, so, so far, we're actually in pretty good shape on the taxable revenue. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I asked Scott. I said, "Is it?" He said, "It's like 97, 98 percent of historical norm." So we're 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 doing okay. That's that's really not hurting us. 
Was there any other questions about the overview? Uh, if not, then the next page you will see is that I actually, I condensed the entire budget into a one page synopsis. Um, basically, I really only made four changes. Historically, I made more. All these budgets came in flat. I mean, they literally were flat. And if they weren't flat, their only increases were something we couldn't control. Um, you will see that in assessors 14 ton, 10, I reduced it by $75. This goes to the conversation the Board of Assessors had in reference to the assessments on utilities. To be honest with you, this may actually be a valid need of them going forward. But part of their presentation was is that this became a state mandate or a state regulation through rule or law. And so I've spent the last couple of months, or the last month and a half, um, and I haven't been able to determine that. So it may very well be something we need, but at this point, absent that documentation, I couldn't make that recommendation to increase it. Uh, the next budget is 3,000 education. I've discussed the only cut of the $222,000 is identically equivalent to what is the raises are of the teachers. So we're not actually cutting the budget. Had, if the teachers had a 0% like the rest of the town, then their budget would have been $222,000 less. I recognize that if the teachers take their raise, the school is going to have to then either do something because that's a, they have to figure that part out. But um, you know, I, I don't know. I just again, um, we we asked everybody to take a zero, and, and so we I just cut it that equivalent to not. Okay, but the the just for clarification, that is just the um, increase not associated with track and staff. There's roughly two hundred thousand dollars of salary increases still in this budget for step and track. You're absolutely that the teachers are getting. You are absolutely correct. So okay. based on the math, um, the school is we're still budgeting that increase of over two hundred thousand dollars to step and track. About sixty-seven percent of teachers qualify for step and track increases this year. Mm -hmm. So that means sixty-seven of two two thirds are still gonna get a raise. Uh, they're just not gonna receive in addition to that, or actually. I cut the difference because they would be looking for an additional two and a quarter percent, which represents the two hundred twenty-two thousand okay. dollars. That's correct. Um, I did increase two lines. One is is I increased the the street light uh, budget forty-two forty. Every year that line has been running short, and every year we do an end of year transfer. It doesn't matter what pocket of money it comes from, but we really need to budget. I mean, a budget should be actual reflection of of what we need. Um, and we're going to continue to add more streets. We know that. So if we have more streets, we have more street lights, and it's not going to go down. Um, I will tell you long term, I've already had a conversation with, um, I, um, okay. um, I, I have had some conversations with National Grid because I am hoping that sometime in the future, thank you, Lauren, um, I'm hoping sometime in the future we can do something about doing some LED conversions. Mm -hmm. There is an expense up front, it's not just free, but we'll look at that because if long term, if we can get that, we might see some savings. But at least in the short term, we should reflect what actual um, the budget is. And the last one is the Board of Health. Um, in our nursing line, we budget $11,000 for our nurse. $7,500 or so of that is usually allocated for the nurse, and the extra couple of thousand dollars is allocated to supplies. Think like needles, syringes, that type of stuff. Um, we well blew past that this past year with COVID. Um, we've been fortunate because we've been able to offset it with federal funds through the CARES Act or some other grant monies um, because of the state that they've made available because of COVID. Um, but sooner or later, that money's going to dry up, whether it's at the state level or the federal level. And the coronavirus, unfortunately, is probably going to be around for at least another year. So I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that we have the money there to pay for a nurse and do the contact tracing and everything else that we have to do. I will let everybody know that we will always use state and federal funds first. So we budget this, and if they continue to give us money, we will use it. And if this money isn't used, it falls to free cash because we're not going to just spend it. But I do think it would be prudent for us to, to, to budget for it. So with those there, that makes up that budget. So the total operating budget that I would be recommending then would be a total of $37,065,683.
and you can see I gave you the percentage increases with and without the water department and their respective percentages, just so that way you would have the information. Okay. Any discussion regarding the budgets? Um, on the school, did you have a conversation with Mark Broadwell earlier about the ESSER funding and hires? I did. So above and beyond this money, um, there are federal funds available called ESSER II funds. That is around $248,000. Um, his intent is, is that he would like to um, secure those funds. Out of those funds, he would hire three people. One would be a social worker, or mental health person. That would be at the middle school, high school. And then he would hire two uh, part-time people that would both be in reference to special needs uh, for, I believe he called it learning centers that he would be looking to implement at the middle school, high school. He believes out of those three, that the cost would be either budgeting about $175,000, uh, but he did say, depending on who they hire, it could be a little bit less than that. And then the difference would be there again, you know, do we, we're still gonna have to do additional cleaning, potentially additional transportation cost that. So he would he would use that difference to make up those differences. And how much is in their SR2 funding altogether? 200 and- 248,000. And this is, this is this is um, newfound money. This isn't funding that was available prior to COVID. That is true. Yeah, I mean, like we talked about the other night, one of my big concerns is funding that next year, or I guess, or, I don't know, FY23, because um, that puts us, there's right off the bat, 175 grand um, of an increase, because I'm assuming they won't get the funding following year. Well, I will tell you that, um, there is already discussions that there will be what they call SR3 funds. Um, and right now, SR2 is going to be for fiscal year 22. And it looks like there will be SR3 funds. Haven't been released yet. You know, there's, there's nothing concrete. But it looks like there's a, it, it's going to happen. Um, and the reason I know it's most likely going to happen is because not only are school districts talking about it, but I'm on a call with the lieutenant governor every other week with DESI representatives and administration and finance representatives, and they all already are talking about it. <laughs> so it looks like it's going to happen. So in conversations with Mark today, he expects that FY23 and FY24, that some or most of it will be picked up under those funds. But he does concede your concern is valid that whether it's 23, 24, or 25, there will be a fiscal year that the town is going to be 100% on the hook for those funds, for those expenses, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things I asked about in the past, and, and I'm still not sure I got a complete answer, is why can't we bill insurance companies for therapy types of, point, of appointments that are occurring at school? If they have a psychologist and they're providing therapy services sessions, why can't that be billed to the to an insurance company? It, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I think it's a legitimate question. I just unfortunately don't have the answer for that. Okay. Can I understand the Esler funds a little bit more? It sounds like this is a grant. Is this a grant that the school applied for? It is a grant program that the school has not applied for yet. They will be applying for it in April. That's when it's, it's supposed to be sometime to be made available this month. Uh, but they have not applied for it yet because they have not really an application process yet. Now, um, I know I'm new to the Board of Selectmen, but I know when I was on the Finance Committee, when a department got a grant, we didn't necessarily tell them how to spend it. Um, so I'm not sure I agree with telling them they can or cannot hire or can't hire. Um, I would like to think these funds are being provided for specific purposes and that they're being used that way. But I, I mean, I don't know for sure. And I don't know enough about these funds to know exactly what the requirements are. I, I think in, in getting some feedback here on this computer, I'm not sure what's happening, but um, Grants I've typically seen in the past have been for an asset, equipment, 
um, a new project, a system, something along those lines. Um, I don't think I've, and maybe I'm, I'm not thinking broadly, have we seen many grants for, for, for hiring of personnel? Did we discuss what police or fire, one of the two, a couple of years ago? Yeah, so two things. One is, is that, yes, there's been an ongoing federal grant program that you can hire firefighters. Okay. And they will pay 100% the first year down. So it would be 100 the first year, then 75, then 50, then 25. Um, and although I firmly believe that there is a need to hire firefighters in the conversations in the past, we haven't gotten through that for the reasons that Selectman can't hear me to. Sooner or later, you're on the hook for all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't cover benefits. So, um, you know, so the first year might be 100, but if they're on the family plan, you're paying seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 that year on health insurance. Okay. And obviously in year two and year three and year four increases. The only people that, and again, I'm off the top of my head, but the only people that I think that we can say that probably do get paid for it through some grant programs at times is the Council on Aging. So we do a Meals on Wheels program mm -hmm. through Old Colony uh, Elder Services. Um, and Old Colony Elder Services does provide grant money, and then we have to fund those bus drivers. And so some of that is paid for through a grant, and some of that is paid on based on local taxation. Um, I, yeah, so I, 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 that's what comes to the top of my head. Okay, but this would be roughly a quarter of a million dollars in the assessor to, well, 250,000 in the assessor to funding with the majority of it, they want to use towards three positions. And one of the things we talked, David and I talked earlier about was I've heard complaints about out of district, kids being sent out of district for special education. So while I'm not keen on the idea of using grant money to fund new salaries, if those positions are in an effort to reduce our out of district expense, which is huge and probably not very satisfactory when your child has to be transported wherever because we don't have the services. Um, and these two positions would reduce the school's budget in future years if they can accomplish that and provide better services. That's a good thing. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. So if it's if um, he's going to use it for two part-time people for special needs, and it does create some type of savings to the town, then I do think that's beneficial to the town. Um, I think part of the conversation, again, Mary, you weren't on the selectmen last year, you were at FinCom, um, is that there was a conversation about the mental health social worker. Mm -hmm. And it was declined last year because the selectmen at that point didn't think that it should be a priority in the budget. Um, and the school department wanted it, but, you know, obviously they, when we cut it, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they, they placed it back in because they believe it's still a priority going forward. So I think using the example that Mary is using in reference, like, you know, say the Council on Aging, the selectmen oversee the Council on Aging. So somewhere along the way, you made a decision as a board and you said, we want to provide meals on wheels. And as a result, we're willing to pick up some expense and OCES for the grant program will pick up this other expense, again, we'll call it the elderly services. So that was a decision that was made was to expand that. Um, so now the question is, do we want to expand on a mental health professional or provide that additional service at the school? And I think that that's, um, you know, that's a policy decision. And, and that's, a, that's a legitimate, whether somebody's in favor of it or against it, that's a legitimate discussion for um, based on our public policy decision discussion. I mean, I'm hearing a lot about social mental health because the children have been out of school for so long and haven't had their in class lessons, and it it seems like there's heightened concern about that, that these children are, um, many of them have been significantly impacted mentally and socially 
by remote, well, I shouldn't say not by remote learning. <laughs> remote learning has been great. I've been listening to it whenever I'm at home and the teachers have done a great job with it. Um, but the, the inability to socialize in school yeah, and maybe the inability to have that one-on-one -on -one with their instructor, you know, the, the teacher seeing the child struggling in class, a little more difficult than seeing them struggling with the curriculum on a video. Um, but I, I, I'd be a little concerned, you know, on, at the same time, um, are we being overly cautious as well? I, I, these, these kids, from what I've seen, are so excited to get back to school um, and be with their teachers and their friends that I'm, I'm wondering if we're, you know, it, it's, we're being a little over the top on it. But school seems to feel strongly about the psychologist. Are we feeling over the top about what? Our children's ability to get back in school and regroup, are they, you know, there's a lot of concern. I mean, you're hearing it everywhere, social and mental health because of the effects of COVID on children. Um, and no doubt there have been some children that have been isolated and maybe being in school is better, a better place for them to be where they had more support with their peers and their teachers. I'm just hearing that these kids are very excited about being back in school full time. Over and the over. excited. They're also very anxious. A lot has gone on this past year. I want to make sure that I'm clear and sharing my view. I very strongly support having a mental health coordinator in the schools. I see it with my own children and I would like to think, oh, perfectly balanced, nice home life. There is still a lot of stress in the car on the way to school when you pick them up. They, the, there's a lot that has happened to each of them and all at these different age levels. And, and some are progressing educationally, some are not. There, there has been so much that has gone on this past year. So I think if the school department is able to apply for a grant and fund a mental health coordinator that, that way, that way it's not affecting our budget this year. Next year, it could be a different discussion. Maybe they'll have the funds again. Maybe they won't. And we can make a determination at that point whether or not we want to fund this position. I don't think it is, uh, I don't think we should be tying the hands of our departments and telling them what they can and can't do with these grants. I don't know the specifics, but do we even know if there are specifics with, with this grant and that they can only be spent on certain things? I don't know that for sure. Um, so the answer is, is that all these grants now have a requirement that they have to be COVID related. However, all of them are written in such a loose way that, for example, when Mary said, if a child shows anxiety because they've been out of school and doing remote learning for eight months, then that would be COVID related. So therefore, you can hire a mental health person. Um, I will say this because I think that it's a cogent argument that Mary is making that, hey, if we can apply for a grant this year, it's not our money, we can provide the service, uh, and then we can have a conversation at a future date. I think that's a legitimate argument. However, it's never easy to cut something. And once you offer it, it's almost impossible to take back. It is what it is. That's just human psychology. That's just the way it works. And everybody knows and if it can be instead implemented, if something could be implemented for a couple of years and it becomes institutionalized, then it's almost impossible to reduce it or remove it at that point. So I'm not advocating either way. All I am just saying is, is that if this is a policy decision and it's a policy discussion, it's something that you either want to fund and continuously always want, or it's something that you don't want to fund and you don't want. But I really mean this. The last thing I ever want to do is hire an employee and think that a couple of years from now, it might, we might actually be telling you in advance two or three years, we're going to be letting you go. I don't think that's cool. You know, I don't think that's right. That person has a family, has children, has spouses, whatever. Um, so if we're going to hire someone, they should think it's going to be for the long term and not in a couple of years. Hey, well, we look at this. So I think it's a legitimate argument. It's paid for from the grant. 
it's probably a need because the school feels so passionately about it. Um, but once it's in there, you're not going to be able to remove it. That's just, that's, that's, that will probably almost never occur. Yeah, I mean, I am in support of a temporary. Um, I wish it were somehow outsourced through a um, psychological firm rather than being an employee because like David said, it is harder um, once it's a permanent employee in the school. Um, I will say, I don't think it's appropriate and I'm not talking right now, I'm talking in maybe a year or two for um, children to leave a classroom to go um, speak with a, or be with a psychologist. I think that the top priority of a school department should be education. I think that the psychological services should be provided at home through a physician that um, the parents find, interview, and approve of. Um, and everyone in the state by law is required to have health insurance. Um, so it's, I don't think it's really a, um, a thing about being able to afford it or not. I, I think that pretty much everyone should be able to afford it through yeah. their um, health care. And, and the, my other concern, and I've said this before too, when a child's in crisis, it doesn't happen strictly between eight and two o'clock. It happens in the evening, it happens on the weekends. It happens all different times of the day. Is this, and once a child develops a relationship with a professional that they feel comfortable speaking with, and that professional knows this child, and then that child goes into crisis and they can't reach that person is this therapist or psychologist going to be available to this child on the on the weekends in the evening that's another concern of mine because it's that's what that's why i mean it, it's it's true there's lots of different um triggers that could put a child into crisis and if we're taking on this role of providing these services, then it can't just be, it shouldn't just be something, well, it's going to happen during eight and two and that's it. Um, I think a mental health coordinator would be more to help the child reach their educational goals. And it's not necessarily to provide therapy in school. If there is something going on in a young human's life going on at home, not everyone has the same situation, happy home life. And sometimes they need a safe person to speak to at school. I, I, I don't see this mental health coordinator as a therapist or as someone who is going to be pulling children out of classrooms in order to provide therapy. I know with my own children and their friends, I see situations where they go and they have to speak with the school um, in order to find a way for them to learn better, to help them adapt to this teacher's teaching style, to help them adapt to the classroom, to help them adapt to other social, emotional wellness issues that are happening throughout the school system. So I think it, it, would be, um, it wouldn't be fair to say that we're only looking for critical life issues. I think a mental health coordinator is going to provide a lot more in assisting children meeting their educational goals than providing therapy. Don't we still have guidance counselors? Do we no longer have guidance counselors at the school? I mean, may, I'm probably dating myself. That's what, that's what we had when I was in high school and that was the role of the guidance counselor. Do we still have them? We do. How many do we have at the high school? I do not know the answer. At least two. Okay. But I did, the way I did understand the presentation, more so I would say last year than this year, I think it was kind of brief this year, was that it would be more of therapy sessions. Yeah. I could be wrong, but that's the way that I did understand it. That was the that was the way I understood it as well, because when I asked the question about, you know, would this at, at the previous presentation, we didn't get much information this time, but when it was presented the first time, that was one of the questions I asked, and they said that it would be staggered hours, but we weren't told anything you know that to that level of detail this time is that a level of detail we need to approve a budget well it would be good to know because again my concern is if we're going to be providing a child with psychological services then i want that child to get the full benefit of it i would never want to hear that the child has established a bond 
with a person responsible for providing these, whether it's psychological, mental health, or depression, whatever issues the child may have. And then that child goes into crisis during the evening or on a weekend, and that person is totally tuned off. If, you're, if you establish a relationship with a mental health provider under circumstances where you have insurance, seeking a physician, a, a mental health provider in some sort of professional role, that person or someone on call is going to be available to you 24 seven. So when a, that person goes into a crisis at night or on the weekend, they pick up the phone they either get that provider or they're going to get someone on call. If this child, let me finish for a minute, Mary. If this child is not getting those services outside of the normal school hours for whatever reason, then they're going to rely on whomever's hired for this position and the school to provide those services. Again, it was explained to us this, uh, this the role you're talking about is new to me. It wasn't explained to me or to us as a coordinator my understanding is coordinator but how is this part of the budget aren't we talking about grant funds that the school would be receiving that's not in the budget i'd say more so future year budgets than i guess this year although we do have the option um like we're doing with southeastern of reducing the amount if we don't believe that um it's being spent the way that i guess would like to see. Yeah, so just, uh, um, I, I hope I can explain, because I've been trying to explain it to myself now all day. Um, um, the ESSER funds have the trigger mechanism that the Board of Selectmen in the town, or mayor or whatever, but the chief executive official of the town has the right to be able to vote the usage of those funds, and not what they're gonna be used for, because that's a role of the school committee. But we're going to see like with Southeast Regional. What Southeast Regional is saying is, is that they're saying we're going to receive our SR2 funds, but you can reduce the SR2 funds allotment by 75% because the purpose of the funds was that the state and the federal government recognized the municipalities were potentially not going to be able to fund the entire school budget due to lack of revenue. So what they said was, is that we will make this grant fund available and the Board of Selectmen can take a vote to reduce it by 75%. All of that money is still going to go to the school, but you're gonna reduce what you budget to the school by 75%. So I'm gonna give you real numbers. Right now on $248,000 of SR2 funds, 75% is $186,000. So what the Board of Selectmen have the authority to do is that you could take this budget, you could reduce it by $186,000, and then you can then tell the board, the, the school committee, guess what, we reduced it by 186, but you're gonna get 240 above and beyond that. So you're in essence, you're still gonna get 25% more than you thought you were going to get when you asked for your original assessment. So that's what Southeast Regional is doing. What the local school is doing is if they're saying we needed originally $665,000 in order to provide the services we want. But above and beyond that, we're going to take this 248 to add more services. Fear of the ESSER funds from everything I can read was to be able to augment the municipality's ability to pay for the request. So I'm gonna spin around just a little bit different. Had the school department actually said to you, we don't want a $665,000 increase. We want a $913,000 increase. Cause that's the real numbers, 665 plus 248. And then you said, okay, not a problem, we'll get off to you. But we're gonna reduce by $248,000 because the ESSA funds, it become up to be the same math. We didn't do it that way. It wasn't presented that way. To the school, the school was not aware when they presented the budget that there was a role that the Board of Selectmen played in making that vote. Because you'll recall that Southeast Regional brought it to our attention. I've never received anything from the state on the rules and the regulations on this. And when they presented that night, I remember Kathy Grant, the business manager, and Kathy's pretty good. And Kathy said, she goes, I had never heard this. So I've done my homework and my research, and it turns out what Southeast Regional was saying was true. 
So Mary, I'm trying to answer your question, but the reason it's part of the budget process is you are empowered to reduce the budget by $186,000 if you so choose, knowing that it's going to be then provided to the school from the federal government. So they're not losing any money, but they would not have the flexibility at that point to hire these additional people because now they won't be $248,000 higher than what their budget request is. So that's why you do have a role in the conversation of these positions. Is it customary or is there past practice of reducing budgets for incoming grants? Well, yeah, Southeastern. Yeah, Southeastern <laughs> Regional did. So this is the first time we have heard of these ESSER funds. This was all new to us. And if they, I mean, if they hadn't told us about it. Yeah, was that, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to understand, is this to cover COVID expenses or is there separate money coming in to cover COVID expenses? So these ESSER funds were funds being sent directly to the school that is supposed to be for related COVID expenses. But again, I think the wording is, is loosely written where as long as you can make any type of reasonable argument that's COVID related, there will be utilized funds for that purpose. So again, um, they're going to use it to hire a special needs person. Maybe that person would need special needs with or without COVID, but you could still make an argument that with COVID, we're gonna to have to do something, even if it's just a little bit of a tweak of a difference. Yeah. Therefore, it's covered. Um, well, I think with COVID, transportation became more difficult because if we that. were sending three students out of district in a in a small vehicle, that was probably okay. Now with COVID, you probably don't want to put three children in a small vehicle because they're they're in close quarters and chance of um, them spreading. It, you know, if it becomes an issue, spreading COVID becomes worse. So I, I think, Mary, it's, it's, um, it is COVID related, but again, they asked for a mental health person prior to COVID. So I think that the school department firmly believes that then there's a need, but they're still going to make the argument that it's COVID related to utilize these funds. And I think that they can make that argument. I, I, I think they'll be able to tie the two together. Now the debate that we're having, shouldn't the school committee be having that and not us maybe? So my guess is that the school committee has had this debate. Um, but look, this is, I always try to use these examples. Uh, the school department is a department like the police department or the water department or the DPW department. Um, so I'm gonna use the following example. The board of selectmen is the executive branch of local government. It is the equivalent to the governor in the state of Massachusetts. The governor has lots of different departments, some big, like maybe Mass State Police, and some small. All of them have boards, committees, department heads, commissions, and they all debate on what their wants and their needs are. To the governor, and the governor then has to make a decision to balance a budget. That's what you're doing here. You're having this discussion and this debate. The governor then takes that budget of which right now it's a he, but a he or a she, then decides what he wants to fund or not fund, and then sends it off to the legislative branch, i.e. House and Senate. We do the same thing, our legislative branch is town meeting, who ultimately makes the decision. Remember, the governor can veto, you don't have veto authority, but at the state level, the legislature makes the final decision on the budget, minus a veto. Here, the legislative session makes the same final decision town meeting, but you have a role, i.e. like the governor, as the executive branch to have these conversations, determine on what budget you want to support as the executive branch at the legislature, the way the governor makes a decision as to what he is going to support once it goes to the legislature. So there is a role. I mean, I am interested in the two, the, the two special educational instructors, because we've talked about this before, if, if we could provide better services at the school, it would create, could create cost savings, but most importantly, a better experience for the children with these needs. They wouldn't have to go out of district, whether it's part of the day or 
and, and have the transportation tied to it. So that that I'm interested in. Okay, I think we've talked about this quite a bit. And if, is there a motion? A motion to approve the budget as a just uh, the town administrator's suggested budget. budget. So, I mean, I guess I'll second it, but I we have I want to talk about the assessors as well. Okay. Um, so the reduction of 7,500. I understand that we didn't receive um, all the requested um, documents, but I think this is something that could be worth it. I mean, if we spent $7,500 to get, I don't know what the number is. I wish that we had a number, but um, say 30,000 in additional tax revenue from utility companies, um, it might make sense to fund it. Is this something they would start doing immediately if this position is funded? Are they funding it in anticipation of having to do it? Or are they funding it because with these funds, they will start doing it? I would say that. They um, will start doing it. They do, because okay. they won't be hiring someone. Um, their current vendor software company is Patriot Properties. And Patriot Properties does most of the analysis for the town. That's what that consultant line is for $28,000. A bulk of that goes to Patriot Properties. Patriot Properties quoted us $2,500 per utility. We have three operating utilities in town. So that's the combination of $7,500. So my guess is that once they receive funding, they would ask those utilities, they would ask Patriot Properties to assess the utilities. Um, and then at that point, they would then send out a new valuation to the treasurer who would send out the tax rate. Now, I agree with Selectman Cunningham that there is a likelihood that we could pick up more taxable revenue. Right now, they are being assessed at what the state's valuation is through net book value, and collectively, it's $22 million. The theory is, is that most likely under full cash, uh, full fair and cash value, that they will be higher. We don't know what that number is. And quite frankly, they don't know what that number is either. Now, if it's four or $5 million more, times the tax rate, that's a sizable increase. So $3 million times our tax rate, you know, off the top of my head, that's about another $90,000. Um, so the $7,500 is, is absolutely worth it. I would caution the board because I just want to make sure that you're aware of all the facts, is that in the past, utility companies have never filed abatements because it was just set across the state, across the state as to what their net book values were. Um, every single year, our largest corporations in town, think Chile, CVS, for example, C, um, Lowe's, they file every year because they have counsel on board. And their counsel is going to get paid to do something or they're going to get paid to do nothing. So it's just automatic. They always file. I would assume these utilities would do the same. So even if it looks like initially we would capture, say, $90,000 in that example, we're going to end up in court. We will end up spending eight, nine, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 in legal fees. Let's assume just to make math easy that, that um, we it gets cut in half, which is very common uh, for large corporations. So 90 becomes 45, you're minus 7,500, you're at 3750, and you have $15,000 in legal fees, you need it out of 22 grand. You're still in the better. You're still in the better. Um, there is a lot of work there, but we're making an assessment, I guess, was more. What if it only comes in a half a million dollars more? We don't know. Um, and that's why I was looking for that documentation um, because I was trying, I want to justify the 7,500 because I think Anthony's entirely right. It may very well be a great investment going forward, but I was absent that information. Okay, so now with that clarification, were you looking to amend the motion or? Um. I guess not. I guess it might make sense to wait a year. Maybe in a next budget season, we'll have a better understanding um, and have all the requested information that, that you had requested. Yeah, because I, I think you're entirely right. If they can, I mean, nothing's going to be exact, but if they could give us any type of indication that, look, we're going to pick up X amount of dollars, then it's a, it, it's, it, we should absolutely positively do it. Mm -hmm. And we may, you know, my fault, I'll, I'll fall on the sword. You know, it's maybe it's my fault. Um, if a year from now we realize, wow, we, we just kissed away potentially $40,000. Um, 
but my job, I have an obligation to this board to give you my best recommendation. I base that on data and information, not just mm -hmm. in gut. And without that additional data and information, I just didn't feel comfortable making that recommendation. I could easily justify next year. Right. Um, no, now look, I, I, I always do this, is that whenever the Board of Selectmen of FinCom agrees, if there is a budget adjustment, I always send a memo out to the department. And if the department says, oh, by the way, we just we forgot to hit send. It's in my outbox and we've all done it. So if that happens and they say, hey, he, we can always discuss this in, in two weeks. And if you want to try to make an amendment at that point, we can. Okay. But you know, we just we don't have that information. They only have one more meeting though. Is right. we have to go to print. Okay. So, so we do have one more opportunity to make changes if we really wanted to. You do. We've never done it yeah. because we get so tied up. Because next meeting you're going to be voting on warrant articles. Mm -hmm. um, so I always we space it out because it's a lot to do all in one night. But absolutely, if we needed to do it, if we needed to do something in one more meeting, we could if we had to. Okay. I mean, honestly, I'm still up in the air with the um, school department. Um, I think at this time it makes sense to go with your recommendation. I mean, maybe that means us individually, or at least me sitting with the superintendent to get a better understanding of what these positions are. Um, okay, so, so Mary made a motion, you seconded it. We had some discussion. There's no amendment on the motion, right? Okay. All those in favor? Can hand yes. Anderson, yes. Ray, yes. Okay. Thank you. So next we will vote on using the ESSER two grants to reduce the town's assessment without Southeastern Regional. Yeah, so we basically have had this conversation, but their assessment would have been $623,610. As they said in their presentation, we can make ourselves available to 75% of their SO2 funds. Um, and they feel comfortable that their budget, they would still be able to make whole on their budget to do that. So as a result, I believe I provide the motion to you, but I'll yes. ask, um, assuming that you are willing to avail yourself to the funds, meaning that we would reduce our or assessment to the Southeast Regional School is that there would be a motion to reduce it by $29,000. Okay. So I, uh, is there any discussion about this? I mean, that they're offering us money, so I don't think. No, no, no. Okay. So the Southeastern Regional vote moved to authorize Southeastern Regional to apply $29,838 from the ESSER II grant towards the fiscal year 2022 Town of West Bridgewater share of operating expenses and reduce the town's assessment accordingly. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Can I hand yes? Anderson, yes. Raise yes. Thank you. And just for clarification, um, that lowered amount is what was in the budget that you passed. Okay. Um, the next on the agenda, I'm sorry, I just want to let you know. Um, the full circle technology is a permitting software contract. It's an online permitting contract that we received a state grant for. However, I reviewed the contract today and there's some things in there that I'm not entirely comfortable with. I know a chance to, you know, I, I received it today. So with that said, I would ask that we table this into a future meeting. Okay. A vote on antique secondhand license renewals. Um, so every year, they're always due at this time of the year. Again, thank you to Lorna. She does all this work. She does a really good job with it. Um, it is my understanding that she's asking for us to approve it, subject to a couple of conditions, which is just to make sure that we receive all our final documentation, that all fees are paid, and all inspections are performed. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Can you hear yes? Anderson, yes. Raise yes. Approved meeting minutes of February 3rd, 2021. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Can you hear yes? Yes and yes. Raise yes. Accept meeting minutes of February 17th, 2021 for review. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Can you hear yes? Anderson, yes. Raise yes. Lay out the following roads. Vote, discuss the acceptance of the following as town roads. I'm getting some feedback on here. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, um... yeah I'll put it on mute. Yep. Okay. 
It's um, okay. <laughs> That's what it was. Okay. So these following roads um, are all been approved at the planning board level and gone through the subdivision control act. Um, there are six roads. I'm going to separate them into two tranches. The first three roads, BC Way, Meadow Spring Drive, and Elm Terrace, those are all recently developed subdivisions. The planning board rules and regulations, they've been inspected by the planning board, and the planning board feels comfortable at this point recommending town roads. Those roads were always expected to be public, public, and now it's time to convert them to public. Copper Beach Circle, Oakwood Lane, and Sycamore Lane. Again, same theory. These are subdivision roads. Um, they were always supposed to be made public at a later date. Um, and they have now passed all, all the rules and regulations at the planning board. This one here is a little bit different because these three roads were actually built and permitted in the mid 2000s. Construction started around 2004, 2005, and ended somewhere around 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. When the construction stopped, not all the road, the, the road catch basins and sidewalks were not to the standards of the planning board. That developer had come back into town, wanted to be able to conduct, uh, was looking to do some work elsewhere in town in the planning board because we didn't have any tools at our disposal. We were able to say at that point, anything else, you need to complete this project. So um, he had met, the owner had met with and in Chris and Kelly, both from the DPW department, um, and also Hugh Hurley from the planning board. It's my understanding that they have done all the work that was requested of them to do, which was to bring that road up to um, their rules and regulation standards, refix some of the catch basins, and reposition some of the granite curbing on the sidewalks. It's my understanding that that has all been done. Um, and so therefore, uh, because that was always intended to be turned over, the planning board never made the recommendation because it was substandard. Now they're making the recommendation to approve it because those roads are now meeting the standard. So at this point, um, the way the Subdivision Control Act works is that we would bring these roads to the Board of Selectmen. You have to place them on the warrant, which you will do at your next meeting, but you also have to technically lay out the road. Um, and laying out the road, in theory, is pulling out the maps, looking at them, seeing as to that they go 35 feet in one direction, 60 feet in another. We've supplied the maps, um, but I can't really answer any questions on them because that's a playing board rule, you know, role. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll do them my best to answer them. If not, then I would ask you for a vote in which you would say that you would lay out and approve the roadways as presented and laid out by the planning board and recommend for town meeting. Um, and, um, and then you have sufficed the Massachusetts general law for that. And then at town meeting, you'll, when you place it on the town meeting warrant, town meeting then has the ultimate decision in accepting the road. Uh, the only road I had ever really heard much talk about was Copper Beach. I, th I think everyone in town yeah. knew about that, the deficits, deficiencies with that. But if it's been brought up and it was always intended to be a public road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have any issues with this. So and this, this will include Chapter 90 funds as well, right, once they're accepted? Or when does Chapter 90 funds increase once we accept these roads? Yes, that's a good point. So once the town meeting accepts the roads, they then get recorded. Um, and, um, and then during that process, mm -hmm. we will send the town meeting votes to Chapter 9, to, to um, Mass DOT. And the Mass DOT will recalculate the roads, miles that we have in town. And then based on that formula, our chapter 90 funds should increase. I honestly don't know the answer to your question. I don't know if it's going to take, once we send it, you know, it's on them. So I don't know right. if it's gonna take two weeks, two months. Uh, I doubt it's gonna take two years. But it probably will take four, five, six months. But the hope is, is that by FY23, so a year from now, hopefully our chapter 90 will increase accordingly. Were and these roads already receiving services like plowing and were the school buses able to go down them? Um, I know we're not plowing some of these roads, although I know some of them we are, for example, Copper Beach we're plowing because the developer had left. Right. And after, I mean, you know, we can't leave people stranded. Um, so um, I looked this up. 
1988, the Board of Selectmen took a vote to accept a mass general law that allowed us to be able to plow, plow private roads. Okay. So it's not like we were doing something illegal. Um, but yeah, there are some services that were being provided. So okay. the real benefit to the town now is, especially if we're already doing some of the plowing, is let's get in some Let's money. get reimbursed for um, it now through the Chapter so, 90 um, funds, right? You know, none of these right. are one roads. No. You know, so at one time I think I figured it out, it was something like $600 per mile. So BC Way, Elm Terrace, these, I mean, they may even only be a quarter of a mile long. They're not that long. So it's not going to be a substantial increase. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if we pick up three or $4,000, it's three or $4,000. Is there a motion? So moved. So I would just want to make sure that the motion is, as I said, the motion is to lay out and approve roadways as presented and laid out by the planning board. Okay, I would like to lay out as presented and approved by the planning board. Second. So, all those in favor? Canadian, yes. Anderson, yes. Rays, yes. Okay. Vote to approve vacation carryover request for Danielle Milson and Tom Souza. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have a quick question. They're both full time employees, right? Yes. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Kenahan, yes. Uh, Anderson, I almost said Kenahan. Anderson, yes. <laughs> Raise yes. <laughs> Guess what, Anthony? You and me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, discuss future in person meetings. Um, so that's a conversation. I mean, I, I, um, we, there has now been some lifting of the regulations. Uh, there is still uh, there's still some capacity issues and still have to social distance with six feet. Um, the reality is is that this room would just be too small to really have in person meetings. Uh, you would be at max capacity pretty quick. Um, just if with one person. <laughs> yeah. So um, so if the board wants to go to an in person meeting, then the FinCom has decided to do that, and we are meeting at the Council on Aging. That gives us enough space. We can allow people to be more than six feet apart and not go. And unless they had 100, 100 people show up, we wouldn't max out on the capacity. So if you would like to do in-person meetings, um, then we would have to change venues to somewhere different. But I thought it was important for, for you guys to have that conversation. I would like to do in-person meetings. So would I, especially before budgets, but well, before town meeting. I think it's important for the, the public to have an opportunity, the voters to come in and ask questions. Um, is the town hall open? Town hall is not open right now. It's open and everyone is reporting and coming to work, but it's not open to the public in general. It's by appointment. And I was a little disappointed over that. I spoke with the Board of Health and they were totally against reopening town halls to the public. So I have to defer to them and respect their recommendation on that. Well, based on that recommendation, I am against in-person meetings until the Board of Health says the town hall is safe to open. Well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in town hall, though. We would be at the Council on Aging. And I will say the Board of Health is having in-person meetings. They are allowing the public to their yeah. meetings. I think the, the bigger fear here is, and if I might be wrong, but some departments, you only have two people, maybe one even here. And if that person or those two people get COVID, that shuts down the whole department. Yeah. Um, and I do want to say the remote participation aspect of the of public meetings is still allowed. So if we do an in-person meeting and Mary wants to continue to participate remotely, she still has that legal flexibility to do. All right, so is there a motion about in-person board meetings going forward? I'll make a motion um, to have future meetings um, in person. Is there a second? So that would be as of the next meeting? Yes. Yeah. No, no, I don't second that. Okay, I'll second. I'll second that. All those in favor? Can you hand yes? Raise yes. 
Anderson, no. And if I may, I just want to make sure I'm doing it where it is that you prefer to do it. I think the COA is the most likely aspect, so I want to make sure you're comfortable. Yep. That would be the way. I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, would we still do 630? Would you want to do it any earlier? Would it be better to do it early? If they have to, I mean, they're not having anyone into the COA right now, right? No. So, and when does FinCom meet? What night? They meet Thursday nights at 6.30. Okay, so that means after our meeting, they're going to have to go in and sanitize? That's correct. They, they, we, are, we are sanitizing after their meetings, yes. The okay. fire department is our Ms. Freta. Is that something they can do the next day? They don't have to do it that night? It, whatever schedule. I think they normally do it at night only, so that way whatever COA staff is there in the morning, it's already been sanitized for them. So okay. they do go in usually like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. At night? Yeah. Okay. So would it, I mean, would it be better for them if we started, I mean, started our meeting at six, just so we could hopefully be out of there by 839? Or is that, I'm just putting it out there for everyone. I don't have a problem with that. I don't know, Mary, are you able to do six or is that? No, no I'm sorry. I can't do six o'clock. I would have to do 630. Okay. All right. All right. Let's stick with 630 then. Okay, communications and reports from boards, commissions, and town officials. We have a report from the bylaw study committee. I'm oh, sorry, did we miss one? Did I? Um, we, H, we didn't do H. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I skipped that. I checked it off. I went ahead. Okay, vote on sick time, vacation, longevity benefits for town accountant. So I placed this on the agenda uh, because I wanted to be able to have a conversation. Um, she is a non-union, non-contractual employee. However, to be honest, at this point, I'm not prepared to actually speak to it. So I'd rather the board just deal with it. Yeah. All right, sorry about that. I jumped right over that one. Communications and reports from boards, commissions, and town officials report from the bylaw study committee. Um, so there was two bylaws submitted to the bylaw study committee. One was in reference to a driveway bylaw that would impact new construction of driveways. The second one was to ban all plastic bags to be utilized at our retail establishments in town. The driveway um, bylaw was recommended from the Conservation Commission. And after discussion, the Conservation Commission decided to table it and not move forward with it. Um, similar on the plastic bags, uh, the bylaw study committee had posed multiple questions to the proponent. The proponent, um, according to the report, uh, wanted to be able to get back to them with some answers and has agreed to come back to them at a future date. So at this point, there are no proposed bylaws from the bylaw study committee. Okay. Any questions on? No? No. Okay. Correspondence from the public to determine a course of action. I don't believe we have any correspondence. Public comment period. Um, we'll look forward to that at our next meeting. Town administrators report. So thank you. So under my COVID-19 update, our numbers unfortunately do continue to increase. Uh, two weeks ago, we had 16 active cases. Uh, last week it was 21. And as of yesterday, it was 26. So when I say these numbers, that is the amount of new cases from Tuesday to Tuesday in town. Um, so unfortunately, our case counts continue to increase. Um, on the first page that, that Lorna just had up, we had a, a, a map of Massachusetts. So when we start uh, back on March 11th, they put together a memo uh, because like Denise said, was anticipating and um, highly encouraged to get the town hall back open to the public. Um, and so I put a memo together. Uh, at that point, our numbers were trending lower. Uh, everything looked good. Vaccinations were, were starting. And so I said, okay, let's give everybody a couple of weeks, get reacclimated, let the, let the public know, and we'll target April 5th. Unfortunately, almost like just pure bad luck, ever since I put out that memo, everything just inverted and started increasing. At that point, uh, we turned red the following week, and we were the only town in all of Plymouth County that was red. There are now nine other towns or municipalities that in Plymouth County that are red. So it's not just us. 
Uh, you can see how heavily red it is down now on the Cape. And I can tell you some of our border towns, like for example, Brockton is now red um, and Raynham is now red. Um, two of our border towns um, are on the cusp of turning red. Um, so they may not, but the way they're trending is that case numbers are increasing and they're right on the level. Um, it may very well be that they go red as well. So um, I did not uh, open the town hall on April 5th. Um, I'm sorry, because I know that there were some people who would like to have seen us do that. But based on the fact that what we were in the red, that our case numbers were increasing, and after getting receiving consultation from the Board of Health, it seemed like the appropriate thing to do. So we sent out another memo to the staff informing them that we would continue to monitor the data and the numbers. As soon as we start trending in the right direction, then I do want to open town hall as quickly as we can. Can you remind me what's red, what the criteria is to get? Yeah. So their official criteria is 25 people per, uh, per 100,000. It's hard for me to understand all those numbers at some level because you know, right now we're at 26 cases and we don't have 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's they, still a mathematical issue. Yeah, there's a rolling average of 14 days and how they do it. Um, but still, I mean, if you think about this, we have 7,500 people. So just times the number by 10. So if they did it per 75,000 people, um, then we would need 250 people in cases. So that's what they say that the case count is um, to be read. So I've never really fully understand how they get to that point. I'm just assuming that whatever methodology they use is consistent across the board. And as a result, it puts us and everybody else where it is. Um, Are the cases still pretty spread, spread out, David? Or do we have concentrations of one household? I know it's not 26 in one household, but I mean, <laughs> is there, uh, there, there are concentrations. Yeah, that's, that's the one positive thing <clears throat> is that there's more concentrations. So at one time it was spread out. So we had 20 cases, it might actually be 20 different residents. Right now we are seeing multiple in one home. So it's a little bit more concentrated than in the past. Positive to that is, is that hopefully that means, you know, one person brings it home and four people get it. Um, and that's all of five people. Right. So, um, so hopefully that that's a positive. What's discouraging and, and a little bit, you know, I don't want to say frustrating because there's nothing anybody can do about it, is that whatever methodology they use to be in the red, we've been here now for almost a month. So even though we're seeing concentrations, we're seeing still increasing numbers, not decreasing numbers, and tripping whatever that methodology metric that they use, we continue to trip it. So that, that's, that's what's a little discouraging. I will tell you something that's more encouraging um, is that we have done our uh, vaccination now at the Housing Authority. Good. So um, everybody <clears throat> there has received their first shot. And next week, everybody there will be receiving their second shot. Um, from what I, I'm led to believe that 100% of the people that were eligible for it signed up for it and received it. So that part is good. Uh, the second thing is, is that the Baker administration announced this past week that they are going to provide a mobile uh, unit. So that way, if you have people that are homebound and are unable to be able to um, uh, access vaccine by going out, is that they are now going to allow, uh, there is a, a phone number. I meant to get it to one earlier today. I didn't. I'll make sure it gets posted on our COVID page on our website. Um, our Board of Health signed up for it. Um, and so if there is somebody that is homebound, they will call this number. The state vets them. The state asks all the questions to make sure they qualify for the program. And if they do qualify for the program, and our local board of health is certified for it, which we signed up, so we are, um, they will then refer those individuals to our local board of health, and then we will actually make arrangements to get vaccine out to those people. So I think that's a positive as well. Okay. If you put that on the on the towns, um, are you gonna put it on the Facebook page or just on the web page? If you put it out on the Facebook page, I think that will, you know, people will flow it out because of my my um, thinking is that they may have relatives in other towns, 
that they'd want to get this word out to so that they can go to their own town officials and Board of Health to see if they've signed up and they're available for them. Yep. I know we have some um, some adult children out of state who have been worried about their parents or their grandparents mm -hmm. in West Bridgewater having access to get a vaccine. So, and they may, they, I don't know if they're incapable of you know, making the trip somewhere or not, but if they qualify for this, it would be nice. I have the phone number right here. It's 833-983-0485. Monday through Friday, nine to five. Thank you. Post that information. Okay, great. Um, and, um, and we'll get out this. So that's, that's positive. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got our housing authority vaccinated and, and, um, and we'll have an opportunity now to take care of some of those people. Uh, is there any other questions in reference to COVID? We're the, are the, is um, Brockton Brock Center still doing vaccinations? So you know? yes, yes. they are. Yes. And it's open to the public, to so all communities. You know. So my understanding is is that there's multiple centers there. I believe the one at the Shaw Center is open to the public, and the other one that they do is only open to Brockton residents. I don't. I'm not entirely positive, but that's what I've been led to believe. Um, and so again, people would register for those through the state website. And the state website will, will direct them. I, I think, I mean, this is what I'm led to believe, I've never done it, but I'm led to believe that when I put in, if I were to go on the state website and I register, you know, you have to put in your address. Yeah. It's not, it's going to gray out Brockton. You're not going to be able to sign up for that one. I believe the other one you might be able to sign up for. It. I do that they did some restrictions on it, but they, but Brockton is part of 20 or 19 other municipalities that have been getting vaccine directly so that way they can vaccinate their municipality. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, next one is Outfront Media. Um, one day I'm hoping to be done with this. Um, Outfront Media, um, the board of, uh, three years ago, we went to town meeting and on Walnut Street, 255 Walnut Street near the bridge, we got town meeting approval to sell that billboard. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, we were told nobody will ever buy it, nobody ever wants it, but my feeling was, if it's sitting there, we might as well get some money for it, and we do have a buyer for it. Um, the per we went out to bid, the person um, entered into a purchase and sale agreement of which the Board of Selectmen signed in March of 2019. Uh, that's March of 2019. Since then, they have entered the permitting process and for different reasons, some due to COVID, due to, some due to other purposes. Um, they have not been able to finalize their permitting process. So in the purchase and sale agreement, it says that they must complete their permitting process up until this date. And we're past that. So for the fourth time now, I'll be asking for the board to extend the, the, um, the permitting time. And they are looking to ask that we do a escrow agreement and a fourth amendment agreement extended to September 30th, 2021. And that's what I would ask the board to approve. Do you need a vote or just no, sign? No, it would, it would be a vote and then you would sign. Okay. Are there any questions? No? Okay. Yeah, why does, oh, sorry. Why does this keep getting delayed? So it's delayed for multiple reasons. One is, is that when they first went through the permitting process, they were hoping to be able to do a two-sided digital board. Um, and the ZBA said that they would not do a two-sided uh, board because the other side kind of goes into a res it goes into trees. It would it would almost really not make sense to do a double-sided. So there was a, there was debate, you know, healthy debate, and that's that's what you want. You want debate. So there was healthy debate. You know, there it takes time, um, and so we did an extension of an agreement, um, and then COVID hit. And quite frankly, for six, seven, eight months, the ZBA didn't meet. And now they're starting to meet, but we had eclipsed it back in March, and then we eclipsed it back in September, and so now that's why we're looking to extend it again. Okay. I'll make a motion to um, approve the amendments. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Canahan, yes. Anderson, yes. Raise, yes. Thank you. Um, municipal opt out, we've never had this opportunity before. So every single year we get automatically charged as part of our fees through the cherry sheets, our state estimated receipts and that and um, fees. We get charged through Plymouth County. 
This year for FY 2022, our charge will be $40,622. So we automatically get charged, we must pay the bill, and then whenever they want to come out and they spray, they make they, Plymouth County handles it. And if we believe that we have an outbreak of Triple E or there's something special, we would contact them. And if they can fit it in, they'll come out and they'll spray. For the first time ever, the state is allowing us the opportunity to, be able to actually opt out of that program. So that means that we wouldn't pay the $40,000 and we wouldn't use that service for mosquito spraying. I believe that the root of this is that there are some people who don't like the spraying. They get concerned as to whether or not there's a negative effect on their pets, a negative effect on their garden. If they grow bees or they, they harvest bees, there's a negative effect on their bees. So I believe the root of this is some municipalities were looking to opt out of it. So the state has said, fine, if you want to opt out, we'll give you that op opportunity. However, Triple E is a legitimate public health threat. So if you opt out, you will save $40,000 in this case but you must provide a mitigation plan to the state that they will approve that you will handle it yourself. Um, I don't see us buying a plane. <laughs> I don't see us doing our own spraying. I don't see us hiring anyone. Like we don't have those types of resources and 40,000 probably wouldn't go that far um, if we try to do it on our own. So um, it's on the agenda because I'm looking for a vote from the board. If you want to opt out, you have that flexibility, but that means we have to find alternative sources to be able to still um, combat it and get approved. If you don't want to opt out, then we will continue the going the traditional route, which is what I would recommend. And won't they come out and spray if, if you as a resident call them and say, listen, I'm, I'm up against wetlands or I have a problem with mosquitoes, then won't they come and do your area? They will. Um, now, it's not on demand. You can't call Thursday at four because I know there's one spe specific story that they had a wedding plan in their backyard and they called, they said, I want it for this Saturday. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, but, there um, goes my cookout. <laughs> um, but yes, okay. if you call, they may ask you some questions. For example, are you really near wetlands? Are you really, you know, all those types of things. But yes, in theory, if you make the phone call, they will come out and they'll schedule you. I've had good luck with that. They've come out and they found like a bucket of water and that's where all the mosquitoes were coming from. They've been very helpful when you call them. I have no desire to opt out. So do we need a vote? Yeah, so I would just okay. take a vote saying that you were choosing not to opt out. Okay, I'll make a motion not to opt out. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? Can you hear us? Anderson, yes. Raise yes. Right. We keep our spraying. Thank you. Uh, and the last is is that um, I signed off on five people using the transfer station for campaigning over this past election cycle. Just enough for our table. All right. Is there anything else? No, hearing nothing. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Can you hear yes? Anderson, yes. Raise yes. Thank you and good night. <laughs>